Good morning. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe 2018 here in beautiful Copenhagen. And I'm going to start with just a couple updates around uh, our event and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which runs it. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, and particularly our diamond and platinum ones, without whom we couldn't have a conference. Yeah, let me go back there. Thank you to everyone here. Uh, Kelsey Hightower, our co-chair, was remembering back to three years ago when it was hard to get anyone to sign up to be a sponsor. So, uh, wow, what a difference uh, a couple years makes. And um, just a few quick announcements. We have um, a sponsor showcase starting right after these keynotes at 10.40 a.m. There's a newcomer lounge in Center Hall E, uh, both tomorrow and today at 10.40, and it's today at 3.20 as well. Every day we're gonna have lunch in uh, Hall C at 12.30 p.m. Today only we're gonna come back here for the keynotes at 5.10 p.m., and then directly afterwards we're gonna have our welcome reception and booth crawl, which are sponsored by Accenture, and uh, that's gonna be at 6.15 p.m. So uh, I would ask you to please walk around and chat with the sponsors this week. They have some great stories to tell. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the growth of KubeCon Cloud Native Con. Uh, when Kelsey and uh, Patrick L Riley and uh, Joseph started this back in November 2015, there were 500 people there. We have 4,300 uh, people here in Copenhagen today, the biggest event we've ever done, um, and up even from Austin. This is uh, almost triple the amount a year ago in Berlin. And uh, just a few updates on CNCF, we now have 22,000 developers across our 20 projects contributing in different ways. Uh, we have a free course on edX and introduction to Kubernetes that's had 24,000 people take it from 155 different countries. And uh, our certified Kubernetes program now has implementations from 55 different vendors. Uh, today, I'm pleased to announce a new certification program we're rolling out called the Certified Kubernetes Application Developer. This is not if you administer the cluster, but if you're just developing the applications that are gonna run on it, uh, how to think about that and build it. Uh, we have the beta certification has just gone live. It's at cncf.io. Last year, we announced our certified Kubernetes administrator program, and that's already had 2,000 people uh, take it. So we're thrilled to see that growth, and then this is the natural complement to it. Uh, CNCF continues to grow. We uh, announced 30 new members today, bringing us up to 216, and that's up from 81 a year ago in Berlin. Uh, of those, I'm particularly pleased to highlight the 52 companies in our end user community. And you can see just some really amazing brands and um, uh, publishing, finance, technology, all sorts of different areas that are sharing their experience and their requirements back with the CNCF hosted projects. Um, I'm also pleased to announce today three new gold members of CNCF, DigitalOcean, NEC, and Sumo Logic and uh, one new platinum member, JD.com. They are the largest retailer in China. Uh, they've been using Kubernetes in production since 2015. They have 20,000 servers running Kubernetes, and uh, their largest cluster is over 5,000 servers. So now I'd like to look at a deceptively simple question. How good is our code? A year ago, we were in Berlin, and we had uh, this graffiti on the backdrop of the keynote stage, since we didn't have the giant ship. And if we zoom in, we can see orchestration, containerization, microservices. Which of these is the most important? Let's watch a video that helped me understand my priorities.
Yeah, it's a great video. And let me just give a quick shout out to Bloomberg, uh, an end user silver member of CNCF and who's been a great supporter of ours, but um, is doing some great journalism there. So after raising and burning through $120 million of venture capital, Juicero collapsed last September. The former CEO, Doug Evans, then went on a 10-day cleanse, drinking nothing but live water. What is live water, you ask? Unfiltered, untreated, unsterilized spring water. I haven't tasted tap water in a long time, Doug Evans said. You have to be agile and tactile and be available to experiment. Literally, you have to carry bottles of water through the dark. So let's look at the live water of software development. Our new software consultancy produces what we call raw code, guaranteed not to have passed through continuous integration or any kind of onerous testing. The result is a palpably richer and more authentic software experience. <laughs> All credit, of course, goes to QNTM, who actually did the tweet. But uh, let's now look. How many of us use SQLite? And uh, it's a trick question because uh, SQLite is built into iOS, Android, Chrome, and Firefox. So we all do. Uh, our software is not as good as SQLite. SQLite's developed by, mainly by one highly regarded developer, Richard Hip. It has 100% branch test coverage, millions of test cases, literally a thousand times as much test code as product code. Um, and yet, uh, American Fuzzy Lop came along. Not this American Fuzzy Lop, but the software fuzzer that was built by Mikhail Zalewski that uses genetic algorithms to find bugs. And it turns out that SQLite still has bugs. When Zalewski ran AFL against SQLite, he found 22 bugs in 30 minutes of work. Now, I want to point out that SQLite quickly fixed all of those, and not just that, but actually incorporated AFL into their release process. But our code is not as good as SQLite's. And it's not enough to just look at the surface area of the code that we've written, because our app is potentially vulnerable to all of the software it depends on, and transitively to all of the software that that software depends on as well. I did the calculations on an app that CNCF has been building called the Interactive Landscape. And uh, let me give a shout out here to David Wheeler, the author of Slock Count, which is the tool we use. So uh, Linux has 17 million lines of code, or slocks. And uh, Kubernetes, amazingly, is now double Linux's lines of code count at 35 million. I will point out, for all this software, we're not using every line of code in our implementation, in our installation, but somebody is using it for theirs. So then, uh, this software uses a framework, Node.js, which is uh, 12 million lines of code, almost 70% of the size of Linux. And then it depends on a ton of third-party libraries, things like Webpack and Babel, that are two and a half million lines of code. And uh, finally, our code itself is only 40,000 lines of code, um, but, uh, which is meaning that when we uh, install the NPM modules, that's 63 times more code in the libraries we depend on than what we wrote directly. So now let's look at the software stack overall. And uh, we can see that those lines of code, every part of this chart represents a potential vector for vulnerabilities. And I left out one part of the pie chart. Our code is less than 0.1% of our software stack. All of this code is vulnerable. Um, we're not the only ones working with this software stack. Unfortunately, there's black hats who are looking for vulnerabilities in every part of our stack, whether or not it's open source. So um, as some examples, Webpack had a, a major vulnerability called divide concept. Uh, Node.js was vulnerable to Heartbleed because it depends on OpenSSL. Kubernetes had the subpath vulnerability a couple months ago. 
and uh, Linux has recently been dealing with Spectre and Meltdown. Although uh, Linux stable kernel maintainer Greg Crow Hartman got me to correct here that these are actually fixing bugs in the underlying hardware. Um, but uh, he would also admit to the fact that Linux has had tons of serious security bugs and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So the power of open source is the ability to leverage thousands of other developers that are finding bugs and making fixes to the software we depend on. But a software patch doesn't help unless we've deployed it into production. How can we have the confidence that deployment won't break anything? And the answer is continuous integration, CI. So what kind of tests should CI run? We have unit testing of individual portions of our code. There's integration testing where we work with external systems like a database. Regression testing where we t add a test after a failure. And smoke testing, also known as build verification testing. And the answer is all of the above. Uh, and in fact, there's other kinds of testing as well, just like the fuzzing that I mentioned earlier. But we can get started with just a smoke test. That's the idea of turning on a machine and seeing whether smoke comes out. No matter how antiquated the code base that we've inherited, we can write some smoke tests that at least test the happy path and make sure it's functioning correctly. And then we can run those smoke tests on every commit. So let's return to our original questions. First, how good is our code? And the answer is not good enough. So we need to build in the systems and processes that enable us to continuously improve it. And second, which of these is the most important? My answer is that a different part of the cloud-native architecture is the most valuable. Continuous integration, CI. Or to quote Kelsey Hightower, if you don't have a CI system capable of building your application, then Kubernetes is the least of your problems. Focus on CI first. But let's take this one step further. Continuous integration is constant testing. But what is testing? Testing is like science. We have a hypothesis of what we believe our code should do but we don't know for sure until we test against objective reality. Karl Popper defines science as being testable and falsifiable. So what do continuous integration, science, and entrepreneurship all have in common? They each require comparing an idealized conception to the often brutal truth of objective reality. Which brings us full circle to live water and back to Doug Evans and Juicero. Because no matter what you believe, no scientific test is going to demonstrate any validity to the health claims of live water. And even if you succeed in raising $120 million, your company will fail if customers feel defrauded by your product. And no matter how great we might think our code seems to be, it does, if it doesn't pass a smoke test, we can't deploy it. So if CI is the most important step, where does it fit in the cloud-native journey? And uh, my answer is that it comes second. Even though it generates the most value, we recommend that enterprises first containerize their apps, as containerized CI is both easier and more future-proof than doing CI before containerization. This, by the way, is the new cloud-native trail map that's available on our website and as a printed handout at our booth. Um, and what CI does CNCF recommend? On the back side of that handout, we have the cloud-native landscape a graphic that uh, has been described at times as useful, overwhelming, and the hellscape. <laughs> so uh, let's zoom in on just the CI portion. And uh, you can see some of the options. But to conclude, I'll give you a, a quick demo of the interactive landscape application that I was talking about before. It's designed to let you explore the cloud-native ecosystem in depth. And so uh, please feel free to try it on your phone right now. It's l.cncf.io. 
and I'll uh, give a quick shout out to the fact that it's actually a serverless application. Uh, it's, there's literally no server, it just downloads a static file and runs locally. So it um, helps assuage the demo gods, among other things. But uh, what we have here is every single project from uh, that uh, crazy cloud native landscape. And um, we can scroll through them all, but then there's a set of filters. And so, for example, I can look at uh, open source by age and um, uh, see these. And no, nope, the demo gods are striking uh, after all. So uh, that's the, the lesson on uh, trying to do a demo before Kelsey Hightower is going to come up. But uh, Anyway, if I go in here to landscape categories, um, I can see the same ones as that other map, and then I can come into category and choose uh, CICD. And uh, yeah, just loading a little bit slowly. And so if I um, come in and uh, take a look at, say, Argo, then um, we're pulling in information from GitHub on their first commit was seven months ago, their latest commit this week, uh, their market cap, and I can even see some tweets on the news. Um, so I would uh, encourage all of you to um, take a look and play around. Here is uh, Prometheus, um, and I can see that uh, Julius recommending a talk he'll be giving later today also the uh, CII best practices badge and the license. So I hope you um, find this tool useful as you uh, do a deep dive into different areas of the cloud native ecosystem. Um, and now uh, I am thrilled to uh, get to introduce